sixth grade and under, you're going to be dismissed at this time, so you know what to do. Go ahead and go to your places. Um, thank, you, thank you for that special. All the music is so good this morning, and I'm glad to be here. How many of you are glad to be in church this morning? Amen. Thinking about that, Fourth of July, you know, we celebrate that. We celebrate the freedom of our country, and uh, the freedom of our country really means the freedom to be able to worship. And uh, I'm just so thankful that we have the opportunity to be here this morning. And to be here and be, uh, there we go, make the voice of God. <laughs> and to be able to worship freely, open our Bibles, not have to worry about somebody coming in and uh, taking us all to jail. We live in a great country. Do you agree this morning? Yeah. Well, I love your pastor. I love this church. I'm excited about what God's doing here, what he's already done here, and what he's going to do here in the future. And I uh, know and love so many of you and pray for all of you. And I'm excited about what God's going to do in this place. Brother Stephen did a great job on that song, but before that song, he gave a speech, and it was really, really good, and I was, uh, I was with him for most of it. He said, when you're working out, you feel weak. I said, I get that, yes. And uh, he talked about CrossFit and all of that and uh, uh, how weak you feel. I said, man, I understand that. And then he started talking about lifting you know, 150, 300 pounds or whatever. I'm like, I'm no longer with you. I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, but this morning, we do serve a great God who's all-powerful. And uh, this morning, this passage, uh, this is a passage that the Lord's laid on my heart, really, for the last several weeks. And it's a whole chapter, and normally I would never try to cover a whole chapter um, in one service. But I want to give you a few things that the Lord showed me out of 1 Samuel, chapter number 25. And I hope it will be a help to you and an encouragement. I believe God's laid it on my heart to give to you. So I don't know your situation, but this morning, God knows your situation and he has the power to change it. Isn't that an exciting thought? Yes. God knows your situation, and he has the power to change it. And we see that in this passage here, and this is the passage that uh, really talks about the life of David. And to kind of give you a little synopsis of where we are, David has already killed Goliath. David has already killed the, the lion and the, um, the bear, God, or the, the lion. Um, God has already given him deliverance. God has already anointed him to be the next king. And right now in this passage, David is literally on the run from Saul. Saul wants to take his life. Saul wants to kill him. And David's on the run. And we find in this passage, number 25, that's what's going on in David's life. He's been running from King Saul trying to spare his life. And as we come into to 1 Samuel 25, I love it for a lot of reasons. But uh, one, one reason I love it, there's two funerals and a marriage proposal all in the same passage. But there's so much more, and I want to dig right into it this morning. I don't know if you like outlines or not, but I have an outline, and I'm going to give it to you quickly, and then I'm going to get away from the outline, okay? Okay, so this morning, the outline is simply this. Number one, there's an unforeseen opportunity. Verses 1 through 9, we see an unforeseen opportunity. And I want to give you just a little synopsis of what's going on in this passage. In the first verse of this passage, you see that Samuel dies, and all of Israel comes together, and they lament, and they mourn the loss of Samuel. And then we see that uh, David uh, goes to a man named Carmel. He sends some men to go uh, to see this man, and his name is Nabal. And the Bible says a few things about Nabal. It says that Nabal was a curlish and evil man. This was not a great guy. It also says that Nabal was a very, very rich man. Um, he had 3,000 sheep. And this is the premise of this passage, okay? Uh, David had a bunch of men, and there was a battle going on. And Nabal's sheep and shepherds were in the middle of this battle. And what David and his men did is he protected Nabal's sheep. He had 3,000 sheep, several shepherds. And during this battle, David and his men came, and they protected uh, they protected the sheep and the shepherds to the point where one of the servants or one of the shepherds said it was like they had a wall about them day and night. Nothing happened to these sheep. Nothing happened to uh, these shepherds. And if you know anything about Bible times, if you have 3,000 sheep, that's a pretty good deal, okay? You're a rich guy if you have 3,000 sheep. Now, I don't think anybody in here this morning has sheep, but we look at things a little bit differently today than we did in Bible times. And so these 3,000 sheep and these shepherds were kept safe by David. David waits until the battle's over. The sheep and the shepherd have gone back home. And he waits until what's called the shearing day. And the shearing day means payday. All right? If you have 3,000 sheep and they go and they get uh, sheared and they have all of that wool, Nabal had a payday. And what David did was he waited until the shearing day and he sent some men to go and talk to Nabal. 
to find out if they could get payment for protecting the 3,000 sheep and the shepherds. And that's what happens here in uh, verses number 1 through 9. These men come to Nabal, and they come to Nabal, and they begin to ask Nabal uh, to pay David for the protection that was given to them. So we see an unforeseen opportunity in verses 1 through 9. If you would, just read with me, and we'll, we'll look at that passage. And Samuel died, and all the Israelites were gathered together and lamented him and buried him in the house of Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. And there was a man of Moan whose possessions were in Carmel. And the man was very great, and he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife was Abigail. And she was a good woman of good understanding and a beautiful countenance. But the man was curlish and evil in his doings, and he was of the house of Caleb. And David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did shear his sheep. And David sent out ten young men, and David said to the young men, Get ye to Carmel, go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus shall you say to him that liveth in prosperity, Peace be both to thee, and peace to thine house, and peace unto all that thou hast. And now I have heard that thou hast shearers, now thy shepherds which were with us, we hurt them not, neither was there aught missing unto them while they were in Carmel. Ask thy young men, and they will show ye. Wherefore, let the young men find favor in thine eyes. We have come in good day. Give, I pray thee, what cometh to thine hand unto the servants and to the son of David. And when David's young men came and spake unto Nabal according to all the words that came to David, and ceased, not, and, ceased and Nabal answered David's servants, Who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants now, a day that break away from every man his master. So we see a, an opportunity that's missed, an unforeseen opportunity. These men come to Nabal and they ask him for payment for what they did. And the response that Nabal gives is, who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? So we see an unforeseen opportunity, but then secondly, we see an unreasonable objection. Nabal refuses to give anything to David or David's men for the protection that was given. Now this is a very rich man who could have done something. He could have, he could have given them something, but he chooses not to. We see an unreasonable objection. <clears throat> but then we see an urgent offering. What happens in verse number 14 through 17, one of the servants comes to Abigail, and this is Nabal's wife, and he comes and he says, everything that David's men said is true. There was a wall about us. There was nothing that happened to us, and he protected us. And the reason that, that Nabal still has 3,000 sheep, and the reason that I'm even alive is because of David and his men. And we see that there's an urgent offering. Haste was made. Abigail begins to grab things to take to David. Look at verse number 18. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two bottles of wine, and five sheep ready dressed, and five measures of parched corn, and a hundred clusters of raisins, and two hundred cakes of figs, and laid them on asses. And she said unto her servants, Go before me, because, behold, I come after you. But she told not her husband, Nabal. So basically what happens is one of the servants comes, and they tell her everything that David said was true. She immediately begins to get some things together to take to David, and she goes to David, and she bows down on her face before him. And she says, please forgive my husband. She calls him the son of Belial. One of his servants also called him the son of Belial. He was a curlish and evil man is what the Bible says. Humility was shown in verses 23 through 31. She fell on her face and begged David. She understood that David was coming to kill. The Bible says that when David found out Nabal's response, 400 of his men drew their swords and headed toward Nabal's house. <coughs> if he's not going to give us what's coming to us, we're going to take, we're going to take it all. So David and 400 of his men have their swords drawn, and they're headed to Nabal's house, and they weren't just going to kill Nabal. They were going to kill Nabal's whole house, his wife, his servants, everybody. They were a little bit upset that Nabal didn't pay. One of the servants found out about him, came to Abigail, and she gathered all of those things, and she came on her face, and begged David to forgive, and the Bible tells us that David's heart was changed and they put away their swords and they went back home. So we see an urgent offering, but then fourthly we see an untimely obituary. If you read verses 36 and following, the Bible tells us what happens to Nabal. 
And Abigail came to Nabal, and be, behold, he held a feast in his house, like a feast of the king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunken. Wherefore she told him nothing, less or more, until the morning light. But it came to pass in the morning, when, he, when the wine was gone out of Nabal, and his wife told him these things, that his heart died within him, and he became as a stone. And it came to pass about ten days after, the Lord smote Nabal, that he died. We see an untimely obituary. This wasn't a death that needed to occur. This wasn't uh, his time necessarily, but then we see an unexpected outcome as well. Five points this morning. Number one, an unforeseen opportunity. Number two, an unreasonable objection. Number three, an urgent offering. Number four, an untimely obituary. And then number five, an unexpected outcome. Verses 39 through 42, we see uh, an interesting part of this story. Verse 39 says this, And when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord that pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal, and kept his servant from evil. For the Lord hath returned the wickedness of Nabal upon his own head. And David sent and communed with Abigail to take her to him to wife. And the servant said unto David, Come to Abigail to Carmel, and they spake unto her, saying, David sent us to thee to take thee to him to wife. And she arose and bowed herself on her, on her face, and be, behold, thine handmaid be a servant to wash the feet of thy servants of my Lord. And Abigail hasted and arose and rode upon the ass with five damsels of hers that went after her. And she went after the messengers of David and became his wife. And so we see a, a proposal here, and I think this is an interesting way. I don't know how many single people you have in your church, um, but I don't know if I can recommend this, but David's a pretty smart guy. David decides that he's going to marry Abigail, or he'd like to marry Abigail. So what he does, instead of going to Abigail himself, he's like, guys, come here, I need you to do me a solid. I need you to do me a favor, all right? Abigail is a very beautiful woman. It already said that at the beginning of the passage. I want you to go, and I want you to ask if she will become my wife. If she says no, just don't come back. I don't want to see any of you ever again. But I'm not going to go because I can't handle the rejection. And so his men go, and his men come up, and his men uh, ask her to become David's wife. So I don't know if there's any sing people in here tonight, but you may want to take note of that. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. But we see here an unexpected outcome for Abigail. Abigail now has protection, she has provision, and she's been promoted. She's going to be the next king's wife. We serve an awesome God, and uh, as we look at this passage of Scripture, there's really five things that stick out to me. Five things that stick out that I think would be a help to us in our daily life. And it's something that a lot of times we just read that passage and uh, we don't catch the things that we're supposed to catch. And God gave me five things that I hope will be a help to you. The first one is very simple. Do right regardless of who's doing wrong. Mm. Do right regardless of who's doing wrong. We look at Abigail and what she did. And I know that she had, an, uh, she had an ulterior motive. She wanted to live. She heard that David was coming. And David had those uh, 400 men with their swords drawn. And man, she went to work. She knew because of what her servant said that David had told the truth. That David had protected those 3,000 sheep. And that David had protected those shepherds. And so she began to do what Nabal should have done. For we're to do right regardless of who's doing wrong. And a lot of times when we talk about doing right, we want to, talk, we want to think about the, the, the junior church. Boy, we need to go over to the, to the young people, and these young people need to learn to do right. But the truth of the matter is, every day of our life, we are faced with the decisions, and we've got to do right as adults. We've got to do right as teenagers. We've got to make a decision in our life that we're going to do right regardless of who's doing wrong. Man, you think about the, even Christian schools or uh, even in churches, there's people that do wrong. Uh, we had a young man who went to Pensacola Christian College this year, last year, and I was excited for him. He didn't grow up in a Christian home. He got saved in our youth group, and uh, he went to Pensacola Christian College, and uh, we went there during the hurricane. That's where we went. We have family that's there, and I said, let's get together, and let's go out to eat. Let's talk about your semester so far. And so we did, and he began to talk about his roommates, and he said, man, my roommates listen to wrong music. My roommates curse me out all the time. 
my roommates, I'm sitting there thinking to myself, I'm remembering my freshman year and the people that were in my room and how God used those people in my life. And they were great mentors and great friends and all of these things. And I'm thinking to myself, here we are sending a young man who didn't grow up in a Christian home, who just got saved, who's on fire for the Lord. He goes to a Christian college and he's in a room that's full of people that are doing wrong. It's everywhere. The temptation to do wrong. For we're to do right you know, regardless of who's doing wrong. We're to do the right thing. And we see that here in this passage. And Abigail does a great job of doing what's right. But the second thing we see, to not only do right regardless of who's doing wrong, but number two, take every opportunity to treat others well. Take every opportunity that you're given to treat others well. You understand that Nabal had the opportunity to do something great for the next king? He had the opportunity to do something for the next king of Israel. Those servants came and they came to, to Nabal and they told him what happened. And his response was, who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? Get out of here. You may not have the opportunity to do something for the next king or the next president. But every day of our life. We have the opportunity to treat others well. Amen. And as a Christian, we're to treat others well. Amen. We're to treat others the way that Christ would. We're to love the unlovable. The Bible says that we're to love the least of these. And how we treat the least of these is how we treat God. Amen. Every day of our life, we're presented with the opportunity to treat others well. And it starts in our home. Why is it that it's the hardest to treat those that we love the most, to treat them well? Then we go to our workplace, and then we go to a, the gas station. We go to. Have you ever been to the grocery store and somebody cuts you off, like gives right in front of you? It happened to me the other day. So I have a friend who was just telling me this happened to their dad and how he responded. And I was like, I don't know how I'd respond. I don't think that's ever happened to me. I was standing in line at Target. And you know how Target has the two registers and it gets really weird and you never know what line you're in? This guy just walks right in front of me. Then he starts talking to me. So I just start talking to him. <laughs> how are you? I guess this is how you do it. So I learned how you cut somebody off. You cut them off, and then you just start talking to them. You having a good day? How's your life going? Everything good? Yeah, great. Treat others well. Nabal had no idea who David was. But David's going to be the next king. David had done something that was worthy of payment. We're to treat others well, but I love number three. Do right regardless of who's doing wrong. Take every opportunity to treat others well. Number three, allow God to fight for you. Mm. Allow God to fight for you. Well, if there's nothing else you get from this passage, I hope that you'll get this. David and 400 men decided they were going to handle it. And they all got their swords and they went to Nabal's house. They were on their way to destroy everybody in that house. They were going to kill everybody in Nabal's family. I love this passage of scripture because it reminds us that God knows our situation mm -hmm. and he has the power to change it. Mm. A lot of times we get discouraged and we forget that God knows everything. God loves you. He cares about you. And he doesn't just know your situation, but he has the power to change it. Amen. So David and his 400 men, they have their swords drawn, and they're going to go take matters into their own hand. There's a problem, and they're going to solve it. And that's how we live our lives a lot of times. We live our lives the exact same way that David and his men. If there's an issue, I've got to take care of it. If there's a battle, I've got to go fight it. This is just something that I have to do. It's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches over and over again that God knows your situation and he has the power to change it. We need to put down our sword and give it to the Lord. And that's exactly what David did in this passage. David and his men, they, they put their swords back down and they went back home. Abigail gets home. Nabal's throwing a party. He's drunk. She makes the decision, I'm not going to tell him until morning. The Bible says that in the morning when the wine was out of him, that Abigail began to tell him 
that David did protect and that she went to David and that she, she had given David some reward. And the Bible says right there that he turned as a stone. And ten days later, he didn't just die. The Bible says the Lord smote him and he died. The Lord smote him and he died. You think about this passage of scripture. You can't help but think, how many battles have I tried to fight myself? Man, if somebody does me wrong or there's a situation that I just need to take care of and handle, and boy, we get up in arms right away and we try and go handle it ourselves when there's a God in heaven who's all-powerful and he's all-knowing, which means he knows our situation, he has the power to change it, but we don't trust him and we don't wait on him. Allow God to fight for you. Ever get tired? Ever get tired of trying to fight in your marriage? Fight for a position? Fight family? Whatever it is, you just get wore out because we're not supposed to fight. As a God in heaven who knows our situation, he has the power to change it. This morning, I'm here to tell you, allow God to fight for you. Do you believe that he knows your situation? Do you believe that he knows exactly what you're going through right now? And he has the power to change. Do right regardless of who is doing wrong. Take every opportunity to treat others well. Allow God to fight for you. Number four, when you do right, you'll be rewarded. When you do right, you'll be rewarded. Abigail had no idea what was going to happen. But she knew that her family owed David. And so she gathered all of those things in verse 18 and she took it to David and said, please take this as payment. And David's heart was changed and he didn't come kill all them. And ultimately she became the next king of Israel's wife. She had protection. She had provision. She had promotion. Why? Because she did the right thing. When you do right, there's always reward. When you do wrong, there's always consequence. You ever know someone who's just always in consequence? <laughs> They've never learned that there's reward for doing right. But once you start to do right, once you start to do what you know you're supposed to do, and the reward starts coming, mm -hmm. man, you don't, you don't miss living in consequence. Amen. You don't miss the guilt. You don't miss the struggle. Do what's right. There's a reward for Abigail for sure. Lastly, this morning, number one, do right regardless of who does wrong. Number two, take every opportunity to treat others well. Number three, allow God to fight for you. Number four, when you do right, you will be rewarded. Number five, live your life in a way that when you die, you'll have made an impact. Live your life in a way that when you die, you will have made an impact. There's two deaths in this passage. I think it's very interesting that there's two deaths in chapter number 25. And verse number 1 says this, And Samuel died, and all of Israel were gathered together and lamented him, and buried him in his house of Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. So we see the first death here is Samuel, and it says all of Israel gathered together and lamented. That means everybody was sorrowful, everybody was mourning. This was a man who made a great impact in his lifetime. But then we look at verse, or chapter, number, or chapter 25, verses 38 and following, and we see the death of Nabal. And it came to pass, after about ten, after ten days, the Lord smote Nabal that he died. There's nothing more that's said. There's nothing more that goes on. The obituary there is very, very small. And Nabal died. The Lord smote him and he died. All we know about Nabal was he was evil. He was curlish. The Bible also says that nobody could speak to him. The reason that the servant went to Abigail was nobody could come to him. Nobody could say anything to him. He had reached a point in his life where no one could speak into his life. That's a very dangerous, dangerous place to be. He was an evil, curlish man that nobody could speak into his life. And the only other thing we know is that he turned away David and didn't give him anything. That's all we know about the life of Nathan. Live your life in a way that it will make an impact. Two totally different deaths. I kind of look at the life of Nabal. I don't know about you, but I love the Christmas carol. 
Every year, whether I do it by myself, and normally I am by myself, I watch the Christmas Carol on Christmas Eve. It's just a tradition that I have. I don't have a lot of traditions, but somehow that one's stuck. I don't know where it came from or why. I don't care what Christmas Carol it is. There's so many different varieties. I just want to watch the Christmas Carol on Christmas Eve. It's kind of what I do because I guess I'm like a Scrooge. I don't know. I need it at that time. By the time that's happened, I've been putting together toys for a day and a half or two days. And uh, all the festivities and all the family, I guess I just need to watch. And the three, the three spirits come. And uh, I, I, I like to think about this passage. When I think about this passage, I think about Scrooge when he died. And how people were rejoicing that he was dead. I think that's kind of how it was when Nabal died. Every kind of took a sigh of relief. The evil and curlish man <coughs> is dead. If we're not careful, we'll live our whole life for self. And in the end, we may have wealth, but we'll be the poorest because we missed out on what life is all about. You understand that we are here, after we get saved, we're here to make an impact. Mm -hmm. We're here to do something for the Lord. Live your life in a way that when you die, God is pleased and man has been impacted for him. If you focus on living to please God, you will in turn be preparing men to meet God, which is our ultimate purpose. When we think about our ultimate purpose this morning, our ultimate purpose is to reach as many people as we possibly can with the good news of the gospel. Our ultimate purpose is to point as many people as we can to Christ. Do right regardless of who's doing wrong. Take every opportunity to treat others well. Allow God to fight for you. When you do right, you'll be rewarded. Live your life in a way that when you die, you'll have made an impact. There's a phrase that I've used for years, and you've probably heard it. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. The great difference between the life of Samuel and the life of Nabal was what they did with the Lord. Samuel gave his life to the Lord. Every day of Samuel's life was about doing the Lord's work. Nabal lived for self. Every day of his life was to gain wealth. Today, everybody that's in this room is living for something. Challenge you today is live in a way that you'll make an impact. And the only way you make an impact is to start investing in other people. Start inviting other people. Start sharing the good news of the gospel with other people. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. I'm going to give you three things just from that short saying we've heard so many times. It begins with only one life. Life is singular. You only get one shot. Mm. Brother Rick Sorensen, many of you know him, but he says this all the time. I've never done two funerals for the same person. <laughs> it's never happened. He also says this. This is not a dress rehearsal. We don't get to come back and try again. Life is singular. We get but one shot to live for him. God's given us another day. We cannot do anything about yesterday. We're not promised tomorrow, but we can take the day that we've been given and give it to the Lord. Only one life. Life is singular. It will soon be passed. Life is short. Not only is life singular, but life is short. Where does the time go? See some of these kids that we used to see when they were so little and now they're just grown up. They're adults. Which makes me think I'm mid-age. <laughs> Which makes me think, what in the world is happening? Life's short. It's but a vapor. It appears for a little time and then it vanishes away. But what we do with the short life that we're given is so important. Decide today that you're going to make an impact on somebody. Who can you reach this week? I don't know about you, but God puts people on my heart. God puts people in my heart, and if you, if you don't have somebody on your heart, if you ask him, he'll put somebody on your heart really fast. Because there's people all around us that need what you have. 
Out of the 7.3 billion people on the earth, God has given you the gospel. And if not you, then who will tell them? God entrusted you with the greatest piece of information that you can have, and that's that you can spend eternity in heaven instead of hell. You can spend eternity in heaven with God instead of a place so terrible, the Bible calls it hell. It's separation from God. And God has given you that piece of information. But he gives it to you with the expectation that you'll tell others. And if not you, who will tell them? You know, I don't live by your neighbors. I'll never meet your neighbors. But God put you by your neighbors. And God put you with your coworkers. And you can't expect your pastor or your staff to do what God's placed you to do. He's given you the information of how they can spend eternity in heaven instead of hell. One of our points this morning was take every opportunity to treat others well. The greatest way that you can treat somebody is say, hey, has anybody ever asked you this question? If you die today, are you 100% sure you go to heaven? You know what the answer is going to be? No one's ever asked me that before. Take every opportunity to treat others well. Only one life, life is singular. It will soon be past, life is short. Only what's done for Christ will last, life is serious. Life's not only singular and it's not only short, but life is serious. It goes by so quick. Amen. We're to take every day, we're going to do right regardless of who's doing wrong. I'm going to allow God to fight my battles. I'm going to live my life in a way that impacts other people. I don't want to just be a good guy that people like. I want to help them know they can spend eternity in heaven instead of hell. Every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. Whenever we talk about heaven and hell and the opportunity that we've been given and the responsibility that we have, I'm convicted over and over again. But how many of you this morning would say, I want to live my life in a way that impacts other people? Will you raise your hand? I want to live my life in a way that impacts people. I don't want to waste my life is basically what I'm asking this morning. Nabal wasted his life. It was all about self and it was all about building wealth. Did whatever he wanted to do whenever he wanted to do it. Oh, the great difference between Samuel and Nabal. Samuel said, Lord, I want to do whatever you want me to do. I want to serve you with the days that you've given me. If you ask me to do it, I'll do it. You ask me to talk to that neighbor, that co-worker, it's the least I can do for what you've done for me. We're to do right regardless of who does wrong. We're to allow God to fight our battles. We're to live our life in a way that makes an impact. Maybe you're here this morning. We're going to open the altar for a time of invitation. You know, a lot of times the altar is a confusing place. And you just think it's for somebody who's in deep sin. No, the altar is for people to do make a commitment before God say boy you've given me my life you've given me another day help me to give it back help me to make an impact today help me to drop a track help me to say uh, ask a question help me to reach the people that are in my life let's stand to our feet as they get ready to sing this morning I mean if God's laid somebody on your heart maybe God hasn't laid somebody on your heart and you want God to lay somebody on your heart this morning you say I want to make an impact I want to make a difference I want my life to count for something today I don't want to just waste my life and in the end have only lived for self or will the altar's open if God's working on you you come do business with God